Okay, so let's, let's first of all finish off uh, Lucky 13. Uh, I had a few more things to tell you about, and then we'll look at this new, this new attack, and maybe another attack, and uh, we'll see how the time goes. I could still be here at 8 p.m. if you want. You keep going till the bus comes. <laughs> you don't really want that, do you? Okay, so the, remember the key thing about Lucky 13 was that we could, uh, by arranging things carefully, we could arrange that in this situation, when we chose the right delta here, a two-byte pattern, XORing it onto our magic cipher text, this is our target block. We would arrange down here for 0101 to occur with you know trying alternate two to the 16 possible different values here, and this would take four SHA1 compression function evaluations. But the other cases that could occur, which were 00, zero or bad padding, would both require one extra SHA1 compression function evaluation, and that was going to take an extra half a microsecond, extra microsecond which means that your error message would come ever so slightly later on the network. Okay, and you could measure this timing difference. And I showed you a nice picture. Uh, okay, so this is talking about detecting this. Then you can then use, use this to recover two bytes of plain text, the last two bytes. And then you can do more like a standard padding oracle attack to extend this to all the bytes of the block. And of course, the target block was arbitrary, so you can apply this in principle to recover as much cipher text, as much plain text as you like. Okay. Uh, it's not very exciting though because it's very complex. Two to the 23 sessions was what we estimated. But then we said, okay, let's bring the beast into play. Let's start moving blocks and bytes around, like in the beast attack, uh, so that uh, we can reduce the number of ciphertexts that are required, or the number of trials that are required. And we can get it down to something like two to the 13 get requests per byte of cookie that we're trying to recover. And here we're in the specific setting where uh, we're targeting secure or session cookies that are being sent from a web browser to a web server, and we've got this JavaScript running in the, in the, in the web browser, which is able to generate all of these GET requests. And this is just like they did in the beast, but it's actually easier. We don't need any special uh, tricks to bypass this thing called the, the same origin policy, which is this nasty thing that comes up in, uh, in, in, in the web, which uh, gets in the way of doing these kind of attacks. We don't need that. Okay, so this is actually better than the beast in some sense. But we need quite a lot of requests though. So in principle, you can do this attack. Uh, I showed you some timing differences. Now I want to talk about the countermeasures. So this is where, this is the end of the revision. This is the new part. What should you do as a countermeasure against this attack? If you want to continue using <coughs> CDC mode, then what you really need is what's called constant time decryption, which doesn't just mean it runs in constant time. It also means that um, you have a constant <coughs> access to the memory. You only, whatever, however you decrypt, you end up accessing the same memory, so that the cache load times are the same. Everything is absolutely uniform, so from the outside you can't tell what's going on. But think about this, this is quite difficult, because to decrypt you have to do things like, if the last byte is equal to this value, then do this. So you have like a branching condition in your code. So basically you have to implement all of these branching conditions that are needed without doing any branching. Because that will give you different caching properties and different memory access patterns depending on which branch you take. Okay, so it's quite difficult. The, the key thing that you have to do is make sure that the number of uh, hash function compression evaluations that you do is constant, uh, irrespective of whether the padding is good or the padding is bad, or whether the padding is long or the padding is short. So you add these dummy hash compression function evaluations, so the total number is always the same. But that's not enough. You also need to make sure that when you're checking the padding, the amount of time it takes to check whether the padding is correct or not, so that's that byte by byte check, is it FF, 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 okay? That should always take the same amount of time, irrespective of, irrespective of the length of the correct pattern that you're checking, okay? In fact, what you can see, for example, I don't have the picture here, but in the GNU TLS code, the way the padding check was done, um, it took, you know, a few clock cycles longer for each extra byte that you checked. And you can see this running time going up in a very nice straight line. Okay, the number of bytes that you check uh, would lead to a slightly increased running time. But that, that effect here is dominated by this effect here, in a sense, right? The, the computing the compression function is much more expensive than doing a few padding checks. But if you're doing this really seriously to get completely rid of the, the Lucky 13 uh, timing side channel, you need to do this as well. Okay, but that's not enough. You also have to watch out for length sanity checks. So for, remember we said, if you want to remove all of this padding, you have to check there's enough space left over for a message, some plain text, maybe a zero length plain text, but also a Mac field. So you have to be able to do arithmetic checking if your buffer is big enough 
without leaking anything about the values you're doing, you're using to do the arithmetic. Because those values will be the content of maybe the last byte of the padding, for example. Will tell you how many bytes of padding you think you're about to remove. Before you start removing it, you have to check that you won't underflow your, your, your buffer. So this also has to be done in a kind of constant time, constant memory access plan. Basically, it's a nightmare, right? It's really quite difficult. We, we did a basic implementation of it, and this is the before and after pictures. This is before doing all of those things to the code and after. And you see that we got the curves pretty much on top of each other. But they're not exactly on top of each other because we're not very good C programmers. We did the best we could. But they're still slightly, they're still slightly separated. And this is because of funny things about the way that you call the, um, the hash function compression interface. There's different steps. There's like a kind of compute step and then a finalized step. And those take different amounts of time, and we didn't quite get that right. So um, this is better, but not perfect. You can actually still do a distinguishing attack. With a couple of hundred sessions, you can still distinguish those two curves, even though visually they're right on top of each other. They're not actually right on top of each other. Okay. So what you need is this constant time, constant memory access implementation. Uh, and this was done, actually, by a guy called Adam Langley. Adam Langley works for Google. He has this wonderful blog post where he describes exactly how he got rid of all the timing side channels. And you know, it went right down to the last cycle on the cycle counter. He managed to make it absolutely constant time. Um, but it was really difficult, and it ended up being 500 lines of new C code in OpenSSL. To, to get this to be perfectly constant time. So that's like a pretty serious patch, basically completely re-implementing the decryption steps, the whole decryption algorithm in the OpenSSL implementation. And actually this code is also in, uh, in something called NSS, which is, the, which is used in Mozilla and also in Chrome as their, as their TLS implementation, for their TLS implementation. And there's a little research project here for someone. Uh, not all of the implementations were fixed as thoroughly, as, as uh, this patch that I'm mainly developed, um, and some of them are probably vulnerable like this still. Whether you could still do a plain text recovery attack, I don't know. I would guess that it would be pretty difficult now because the timing difference is getting really small, but there's probably still broken implementations out there which you could, in principle, attack and you know, embarrass people. So it's a good project there. For some. Okay, so a little bit now uh, about impact and um, Really, this is about the disclosure process. Uh, and uh, Nadia talked quite a lot about disclosure of the uh, repeated keys or common factors, common primes, uh, attacks that they came up with uh, yesterday. Um, and we had a similar experience that maybe slightly, slightly better. We didn't get ignored by half of the people we talked to. But it took a lot of effort in the background to get people to understand what this attack was and why it mattered to them. Um, but eventually we managed to, we didn't go through a CERT either. Uh, the reason we didn't go through a CERT, one of these you know, national bodies that organizes everything for you, is that when we did go through a CERT in 2009 for a vulnerability in SSH that we found, we found that some people in the SSH community did not like talking to a CERT because they were part of the government and therefore they were evil. Okay? So we decided to do this ourselves and that probably turned out to be a lot of extra work. It would have been much better maybe just to say to the CERT, here you are, you deal with this, you set the deadlines, the timelines, the disclosure period, everything. Please take care of it all. We'll just sit back and enjoy the, you know, enjoy the fury on the internet when everything goes public. We didn't do that. We decided to try to, to do much more control thing ourselves and maintain control. Maybe I'm just a control freak. <laughs> maybe that's what it was. So we went, we finally, everything went public on the 5th of February. We had our cool name, Lucky 13. We had a website. We didn't have a logo. In retrospect, that was a mistake. We should have had a logo with blood or something in it. This is what you need to do. Um, and pretty soon afterwards, uh, basically, all the patches were released. Some people released a little bit early, 30th of the 1st, 2013. So that was like five days at a time. That was kind of annoying, because we had agreed that everybody would release their patches on the same day. Um, and fortunately, nobody then tried to reverse engineer it from the patch because nobody cares about the Opera browser. A <laughs> uh, really nice thing that happened is Oracle, who are responsible for Java these days, released a special critical patch update of Java SE. Um, it was a special critical patch update because of some other problem, not because of Lucky 13. But I'm able to claim that it was a special critical patch update. <laughs> it's kind of fun. 
privacy council, and then there's all these little kind of uh, small, well, GNU TLS is pretty big because I think it's used in um, some of the Linux distributions or it's used in, I can't remember exactly where, but some major uh, operating system uses GNU TLS as implementation. These are all a lot smaller ones, and these are all kind of two-man, three-man companies. And at this level, and actually some of the bigger boys as well, they needed a lot of help, like testing their patches, for example, trying to help them understand what was going on and what the threat was. After all of this happened, and we listed all of these, in our research paper, we listed all of these companies and the, you know, how they responded, I got an email from another small SSL vendor who's not mentioned here saying, why, why didn't you break our implementation as well and mention it here? <laughs> Uh, we are bigger than all of these guys. Look, our, our market share is this percentage, and these guys are only 5%. And it's, you know, it's really, really important that you should, you should have broken our implementation too. It's like, whoa, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry for not embarrassing you in public. And at the same time, I got a very, very nice email from um, uh, a well-known cryptographer who works for, for RIM, who made BlackBerry saying, uh, well, it would be really nice to have known about this in advance, really nice work, uh, just to let you know that we've patched it internally, blah, 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 which is kind of a completely different approach, right? This is a guy called Dan Brown, some of you may know. Not, not the guy who wrote the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> the other Dan Brown, the more important Dan Brown, um, wrote us a very nice email saying, oh, it would be nice if we'd let us know, please let us know next time. And that was a very nice email to receive compared to this, like, why didn't you break my implementation? Who do you guys think you are? So there's like, there's like behind this, there's about a thousand emails going backwards and forwards in total, okay? Just to get this to happen, to coordinate everything, to, you know, it, it, it's, it's really, really hard work. And I think that chimes with uh, the experience that, that Nadia talked about yesterday, of trying to do disclosure at scale. I mean, what you don't want to do here is just build a website and, you know, put it on your Twitter feed, right? Because that's irresponsible. And you might cause panic, and okay, it's only a sort of semi-practical attack against TLS, but you want to try and do the right thing and bring everybody together and get everybody to fix at the same time. But it takes real effort, which is not something you really get credit for academically. It doesn't make my paper stronger or make it more likely that people will be accepted to a conference right, to do that. But it's something you should do as you know, responsible citizens. Okay, uh, Microsoft, I had a very nice exchange with Microsoft. I was actually in China at Asia Curve 2012, uh, sitting in a bar with Brian LaMachia from Microsoft, who runs their, um, who runs their program. They're, he's actually in charge of running their entire kind of crypto library program inside Microsoft. Uh, and then they put out this release saying that actually they had adequately addressed it in a previous modification. And it turned out that they had been contacted sometime before by um, some Russians who had said, oh, we think there's a time inside channel with TLS. And it was almost but not quite lucky 13. So they put some mitigations in place. So Microsoft were actually ahead of the curve here and didn't need to patch. Still, I don't know exactly what their countermeasure is. And it would be really fun to go and get hold of, uh, of well, you can't get hold of Microsoft source code so easily. But you could black box test the Microsoft implementation in Internet Explorer C or in Microsoft Server 2000, whatever it is, and see is there a timing difference. That would be a great project as well. And, and you know, demonstrate that Microsoft haven't really done the right fix. I'm not saying they have or haven't, I don't know. That's why it's a research question. So you could do that too. Okay, so we have a list of all this stuff on, on, on the website, which is rapidly going out of date. Okay. What else could you do as countermeasure? So I talked about this constant time decryption. Um, you could introduce random delays during decryption because then you'd hide this time in the side channel, right? You might only have to add you know, a couple of microseconds to really mess things up. Actually, that doesn't work. And you can just use statistics, the power of statistics, to extract the signal from the noise, okay? And it turns out that something like if you, if you put a, a random timing difference that's like 50 times as big as the actual timing difference in there, it only increases the number of samples you need for the distinguishing attack by about a factor of 10, something like that. So it's really not an effective way to fix the problem. Um, you could redesign TLS, and in fact, um, finally, there is pad encrypt Mac. So encrypt then Mac, uh, a, it's, it's standardized by ATF as an extension for TLS 1.1 and TLS 1.2. Um, but I don't see any signs of it being used to pick up. Okay? But it does exist, I, the RIC number, I can't remember, I think it's later in the presentation. It says what that is. What's really funny about that RFC 
is that it's completely motivated by the Lucky 13 attack, but it doesn't <coughs> mention Lucky 13 anywhere in the, uh, in the RFC, which is uh, the, the author is a guy called Peter Goodman, who's in New Zealand, and if he was closer, I would be shouting at him. Right? He, fortunately, he's far, far away. But that's kind of annoying. Very interesting. You can switch to TLS 1.2, and that's a good idea because then you can use GCM, okay? And this, these attacks don't apply anymore. At the time, though, when this attack was announced, most browsers and almost all servers were not offering TLS 1.2. It just wasn't available. And this work, together with the Beast and other work, is, is really what's driven the, the take-up of TLS 1.2, the switch to TLS 1.2. <coughs> you can also switch to RC4, and, you know, after Beast, that's what lots of people did. And there were people writing on their you know, official blog posts for their companies. Uh, our, our, all of our customs, customers are immune to Lucky 13 because we're using RC4. We already switched to fix the beast. Okay, we'll see later that that wasn't such a good strategy. Okay, good. So, some lessons from Lucky 13. Well, the first lesson is that this Mac encoding crimp construction is a bad idea in capital letters. It's very hard to implement it securely, right? To implement it securely, you need this 500 lines of magic C code written by Adam Langley, who's the only guy on the planet who really understands how that code works, okay? That's not a good basis for building uh, you know, a standardized cryptographic system that's going to be used on a global scale. You want something that's simple to implement, simple to make secure. And what happened is that there was this long history of attacks and fixes, and each fix that was done was the easiest thing to do at the time when it was done. But that globally, turns out to be the wrong strategy, right? What they should have done is ripped it out at the start and said, okay, there's, there's a hint here of being a problem. Maybe back when Bodney's paper first came out, or even when Bodo Muller's paper was published in 2002, the Muller attack. At that point in time, a conservative cryptographic approach would be to say, okay, this is now looking fishy, it's looking wrong, let's get rid of it and let's do something else. That didn't happen. And it's continued not to happen over many, many years, okay? And that's a problem for cryptography. It's a problem for us as academics as well. It means that what we're doing is not really having as much impact on practice as we would like. People are not really taking these research results seriously. And they should, because attacks only get better with time. Or stronger. Okay, I think I said all of this. One thing in defense of the people behind TLS is to say that when TLS was designed in the mid-1990s, it wasn't clear what the right thing to do was, whether encrypt then Mac or Mac then encrypt. And you'll still have arguments with people on the TLS mailing list today about whether encrypt then Mac is the right solution. Felix. Would you still call, like, Adam Langley now coding 500 lines to hash that? Would that be, so is this currently the easiest option to solve? If, if you, no, I mean, you can, you can do, like, a 20 line patch that gets you to that approximate constant time thing that we did. But that probably won't work if you're in like a virtualized environment and you're in the same, you know, you're running on the same hardware with somebody or whatever. I mean, so there it appears like the easiest way to get rid of all the problems. Right. It, it should solve it once and for all. Yeah. This this thing. This thing. This 500 lines. No, the the like 13. Oh. Or do you think there could be something else popping up? Uh, no, because we have a security proof. <coughs> so there's this paper from H11 by me and Rustin Parr and Shrimpton, and we show that Mac encode encrypt under certain conditions, including having uniform errors. You can't tell the difference between padding failures and Mac failures. We prove that it's secure. We prove that it gives you authenticated encryption. But that's not a strong reason to use it because it's so hard to implement it with, with you know, constant time. So I don't, I, I don't say that because there's a proof there can't be an attack, but I think we're getting closer to, 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 to that. Yeah. But I'd rather we didn't use it. I'd rather we switched to encrypt it. Okay. Uh, I was going to show you another attack, but maybe we'll skip it. It's kind of cute. Um, you can read about it in our paper from, uh, from, from Asia Group 11. Let me just say this. So because of all these attacks, we should have a bunch of things in place. We should have random IVs. We should have proper padding checks, checks because of the smaller attack. We should have this very kind of uniform behavior under padding and Mac failures to prevent Bodies attack and our Loki 13 attack. You should also have variable length padding because you care about traffic analysis. And the question is, if I do all of these things, is TLS secure in CBC? You want to answer the question? No, I no? don't ask about the heading. Yes. You said that the application doesn't know. Uh, so the TLS world in a way is uh, transparent to the to applications, applications right. and, uh, So how does TLS know what the length of the message is? 
mean, is the application that knows the message is sending, right? Okay, so the, okay, so Felix and I have been discussing this a lot over the last couple of days. So what, what TLS does is it, is it just receives data from the application layer. It's up to the application to demark in there, to put blank lines or carriage returns or something, to, to mark the message boundaries. Whatever TLS gets, it will buffer and then send. So TLS doesn't think that it's receiving atomic messages. It's just receiving a stream of stuff. But each fragment in that stream can be padded using the variable <coughs> padding. But it's up to the TLS implementation to decide to do that, not up to the application. Is that right? I don't know. Probably not. I don't know. I mean, none of this stuff really works anymore. If you're, if you're a determined attacker, you can still bypass this kind of thing. OK, so this question is, are we there yet? Is this sufficient to get <coughs> security? So who thinks this should be enough? Who thinks it's not enough? Who's just thinking about poor wine and cheese? And <laughs> it's going to be nice, isn't it? OK, well, we'll get there soon. OK, so it's not enough. There's an attack. And this attack. Uh, I discovered whilst driving along the motorway at 11 p.m., driving home to my home in London, I almost crashed my car, actually. It was kind of so exciting at the time. It's a kind of silly attack, but it was the first time, so this is back in 2011, I was working with Tom Wistenpart and Tom Shrimpton all day, discussing how these things might work, and then, you know how sometimes when you're, like, you're in the shower or you're driving, you're doing something where your brain is somehow free to roam? Suddenly it popped into my head how to, how to do this, but it was only because we'd spent the whole day working on it together uh, that this attack popped up. Um, and it was the first time that we had done something like an attack on TLS, and I'd always wanted to do an attack on TLS, right? Because, hey, you know, everybody should have an attack on TLS, right? <laughs> and, and now everybody can. I mean, you know, it's such a rich playground, everybody can come up with a little attack, I think, at any time. Okay, so here's how it works. It's the same as before. We're going to get, I wasn't going to do the details, so we'll go very quickly. We get an encryption of a message, and the message is either yes or no. So it's a distinguishing attack again. But what do you notice about the messages? They have different ones, OK? So formally, we're now outside of the normal NCCA or whatever security model, because we, we're, we're cheating by having different length messages. But these two messages should encrypt to ciphertext of the same size. OK, so you know, just looking at the ciphertext, you shouldn't be able to, to tell them apart. OK, and it's clearly the intention of TLS that you should be able to hide yes versus no because of the kind of block by structure and the variable length padding. Okay, so it should provide security in this case. Okay, so we're going to do the usual thing. We're going to intercept the cyber types. We're going to do some bit flipping because that's all I know how to do, right? That's my whole career. And we're going to get an error message or not get an error message. And what happens will tell us whether it was yes or no. So here it goes. Here's our bad guy. He receives an encryption of no or an encryption of yes. Now I'm making a big assumption. I'm making the assumption that, that the sender has used variable length padding. So no together with oh, and I'm also making another very big assumption. Sorry, I should say this up front. This attack only works when the max size is less than the block size. Okay? So HMAC shell one would have a 20 byte output, 160 bits which is bigger than AES block size. So the attack would not work for SHA-1 in combination with AES. Okay? Um, but it would work, for example, if you had an 80 length MAC tag, or a 96 bit MAC tag, and the block length was 120, say. Okay? So here is our first plain text, no two bytes. Then we have 10 bytes of, uh, of MAC, because our MAC length is 80 bits. And then we have, we have something like 20 bytes of padding. Yes, we have 19, 20 copies of hex value 19. Okay, going here. So now I've used this very well length padding feature. I've gone beyond the first block boundary. But TLS allows me to do this, right? So this could be the cyber And the other case, it looks like this. So now I have yes, three bytes, 10 bytes of, uh, of Mac, and then I've got uh, 19 copies of hex 18. OK, and this now all gives, gives me three block ciphertext, C0, C1, C2, and it's either encrypted no or yes. And we don't know which one it is, right? The devil wants to figure out which one has been encrypted. OK, so what would you like to do? You tell me how to break it, using all of the tricks and techniques that we've been talking about for the last two days. What should we do? What do you know how to do? 
what do I know how to do? What's the only thing that I know how to do? Bit flipping. Bit flipping. Okay, let's do some bit flipping. Where would you like to flip some bits? You've got three choices of blocks to flip bits in. Where would you like to bit flip? C2. You want to flip bit flip in C, C2. Okay, actually what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a big clue. I'm going to delete C2. Okay, uh, I don't want to show you that yet. What I'm going to do is I'm going to chop off this block C2 from the ciphertext. I don't know which case I'm in, but you know, imagine all of this is now gone. Okay? So what would be left here and here? Well, it would be, would the padding be valid or invalid in two cases? Invalid. Invalid, right? Because if I have 13 there, I need, what? sorry, 1, 3. Uh, oh, I said this all wrong, okay. Um, I need 20 copies of 1, 3, hex 1, 3. Okay, 20 copies of 19. I can't have four copies. Okay, and down here it would also be wrong. So how can I fix the padding to make the padding valid? Yes? But you just, just saw in something by modifying C0? Yes, I have an explicit ID here. Okay, because I'm in TLS 1.1. I didn't tell you that either, but okay, we're in TLS 1.1 <laughs> or 1.2. I have an explicit ID. I can bit flip in the ID as well. So how would you like to bit flip in the ID? Any, any hints or any ideas? Let's go bit flipping in the ID. I want to make the padding correct, okay? So what I'd like to do, for example, is maybe there are four bytes here. And I'd like to correct them. What should they be if it's going to be correct padding? Here. 19 sort 4. Sorry? 19 sort 4. I work in decimal, so 13 sort 0. Okay, what do I want to set the value to? What should it be? 4. 4? No. 0, 3. It should be four copies of O3, right? Remember the funny, the padding pattern is kind of one longer than the value of the, of the byte, okay? So what I could do is by bit flipping in C0, in four positions, I could correct this padding to O3, and this block is gone. So then what will happen, if, if this was the ciphertext, would it decrypt correctly or not? Yes, because the MAC, I would remove the padding, the MAC would be correct on this and the header, and this would be accepted. Okay, so I had to bit flip in four positions here. By bit flipping in the last four positions of C0. What would happen if I did the same bit flips down here? In this setting. Right, so I would touch four positions. It would be the last four positions. One, two, three, four. So the last bit flip would be in the Mac. I'd be flipping a bit in the Mac. In the Mac. So what would happen then on, on decryption? Decryption would fail, okay? Because the Mac would be wrong with very high probability. In fact, it would be wrong because it's a deterministic Mac, so it can't be right. So what then? Well, in this case, I would bit flip. I would have a valid message. Everything would be great. In this case, I would bit flip. I would have an invalid Mac. I would get an error message, which I can see. So in one case, everything is great and the TLS connection stays alive. The other case, I, I create an error and I lose the TLS connection. Now I can tell them apart. Okay? So by the pure power of bit flipping, we've broken TLS again. Okay? So here's the details. Okay? So we bit flip in, uh, in C0 in the last four positions, and we use this specific mask here. This is hexadecimal 10, raised you know, four copies of 10, and that turns those 13s into 03s. Antoine? Yeah, just one question. What happens if you only change the last three copies? Yeah. So then it's the padding which is going to be invalid on the first yes. line, but, it but be open the second one? That's true. And that would also be rejected. Okay. Okay, so, so you can also do it that way. Because bad padding leads to a fatal error. So that would also okay. work. So it, yeah. both things do the same. Yeah, yeah, both things do the same. And in fact, other things you can do, for example, here you could have a much longer message that goes into the second block, much longer plain text, and here a short plain text. Okay? So you can have and then, you know, TLS would try to pad up the second one so it was as long as the first one. So we can, you don't have to have messages of length 2 and 3. You could have length 3 and length uh, 18 or something, right? You just, you know, you can, you can play around with the numbers. There's a lot of flexibility in the numbers. Okay, so yeah, we chop these blocks off. And this decrypts fine to know. This doesn't decrypt. The Mac won't verify. Decryption fails. You see we've got 0, 02 to the 3. Good padding. But the Mac computation will go wrong. Yeah, and that's it. Okay, so where does the attack work? Well, it doesn't work for AES. I said this already. Oh, sorry, uh, AES in combination with a any of the standardized MAC algorithms. They all have uh, outputs, MAC tags, 
So this point here is too big in each of them. Okay, so the tag doesn't apply. But remember, there's the, there's the devil's RFC, RFC 6066, which standardizes truncated Macs. Because, hey, who needs a big Mac? <laughs> You're a vegetarian, I guess you need one, but anyway. Um, and this allows t equals 80. It allows you to truncate the Mac down to 80 bits. Yeah, and now we can break it. Okay, so if anybody ever deploys the truncated Mac extension, we have an attack, as long as we use variable length padding as well. Okay, so this is pretty theoretical, right? It's if this and this, then we have an attack. Not so interesting. The point really is that, uh, well, also it's only a distinguishing attack, and I don't know how to turn this into a plain text recovery attack. Be cool if you could. Um, normally you can, and I tried, but I wasn't able to do it. So maybe one of you guys can figure out how to boost this to plain text recovery. Normally you can, so you know, maybe I'm missing something. Okay, the real point of this attack is it says you cannot prove TLS Mac equal to encrypt secure unless you put some kind of restrictions on the relative size of the Mac tag and the block size. That's really what this is saying. It's a, it's, it's a barrier to, to, to a security proof. Okay? And that's how we sort of viewed it in our paper. Uh, and what we do then go on to prove in this paper is this sort of theorem informally stated, which basically says as long as your Mac tag Sorry, your message size plus your tag size is at least the block size, okay, n is the block size, I think of this as being 128, then Mac code encrypt with CC mode encryption, random initialization vectors, TLS padding, uniform errors, is something, okay, A E secure means authenticated encryption, and LH means length hiding, and this is some extra property we proved by hiding the lengths of messages up to the up to the limits of the padding. So it's like an extended version of authenticated encryption security. Okay? So finally, so in 2011, we had a guarantee that the CVC mode encryption in TLS could be made secure. But then came Lucky 13. So does Lucky 13 invalidate this proof? What do you guys think? I've told you the answer about five minutes ago, actually. It's a bit unfair. There's a, there's a, there's a key word, there's a, two very key words here in italics in the theorem statement. Uniform errors, okay? If you don't implement the uniform errors, then so you can tell the difference between a padding failure and a Mac failure, then you can do lucky 30. And the point was that even though we proved this theorem in 2011, none of the mainstream implementations at all had uni really uniform errors. There were always these small tiny differences. And that's what enabled us to do lucky 30. Okay? Good. So any questions about that? About any of that? Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, so we had a paper. Uh, this is myself and Jean Paul de Gabrielli and Martin Stamm and Sasha Bolveva at uh, FSE last year, I think, where we develop a framework for um, authenticated encryption. Uh, in a setting where you have multiple errors which are distinguishable. <coughs> and you actually prove, you can prove some very nice separations that you don't expect to get. And there are schemes that should be secure which you can break and other ones you can't prove secure. It's a very nice, there's a nice theory uh, around non-uniform errors that, that we developed. Yeah. It's a nice paper. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, we call our paper Tag Size Matters. Um, yeah, which if you're Anglo-Saxon is kind of good title of the paper. But, but basically what it says is that as long as the message size plus the tag size fills a complete block and one more, or maybe just fills a complete block actually, it's secure in our security model. But for any other situation, there are practical attacks. So there's this very fine dividing line between security and insecurity for this construction. Okay, so now back to yesterday's news. Uh, this truly scary SSL 3.0 vulnerability uh, it was announced last night, uh, and it was discovered by some researchers at Google. Uh, in fact, I'm going to give you a big clue now. It was discovered by Bodo Moller and Tai Duong. Now, what do you know about Bodo Moller? What did he invent? The Moller attack. And what did Tai Duong co-invent with Juliano Rizzo? Duong and Rizzo. What did they invent together? The beast. 
What does Beast do? What's the one really cool trick in Beast? Sliding stuff around. So what do you think this new attack does? Huh? It does exactly what I'm very strongly hinting at, right? It does Mahler's attack in combination with sliding stuff around to recover cookies. Okay? So let me show you how it works. All right. So remember, uh, oh, and by the way, it's called Poodle. Poodle stands for padding Oracle something, something, something. Downgrade legacy encryption, I think. Legacy because it's SSLv3 and nobody should be using SSLv3. Okay? So remember this from yesterday's lecture, okay? We make this magic ciphertext where the Mac ends on a block boundary, okay? So the last block is going to contain padding. And what we now do is we put our target ciphertext block here on the end and we send it for decryption. And the condition is it will decrypt properly if and only if the byte value here is OF. Okay? The byte value in the last position has to be OF. And this assumes that the implementation does not check the padding format strictly. It doesn't do a strict check. Okay? Now, this is exactly the situation in SSL v3. In SSL v3, in the specification, there's no requirement that you send a particular sequence of bytes like 020202 or 030303. All you have to do is send a sequence of random bytes, and then the last byte tells you how many other padding bytes there are to remove. So SSL v3 says, let's all relax about padding. Let's not worry about padding too much. Just strip off as many bytes as there are indicated at the end in the last byte position. Okay? So SSL v3 is perfect for Mahler's attack. But what did Mahler's attack do? What did it recover? The last byte in the target block and the probability of recovering it was 1 over 256. Because we have to hit OF here. And you can think of this as kind of being randomized. And so the chances of hitting the right value are just 1 over 256. And then you lose the TLS connection. Okay? So it doesn't look very serious. And perhaps that's why it was ignored for a long time. Okay, now what would the beast enable you to do? Or the beast style techniques enable you to do? Well, you could arrange that this target block, C star, actually came from down here somewhere and contained the cookie. Okay? So C star on the end here is actually a copy of something from earlier in the Cyberfight stream. And it's going to be the block that contains the TLS, the, the, not the TLS cookie, the, the session cookie, the secure cookie. Okay? So you would be able here to target the last byte of the cookie, maybe, or one of the bytes of the cookie. But what the Duong and Bissell techniques enable you to do is basically by padding in the message, by using padding of the HTTP layer, the application layer, to move the position of the cookie around okay, in this stream. So, so that every byte that you want to recover of the cookie at some point will appear here. Okay? So you can play with where the cookie sits relative to the block boundaries in the way that I showed you before, sliding everything around, so that eventually, over many trials and in a controlled way, every byte of cookie will appear here enough times, you know, on average two, five, six times, that you can recover it. And that's it. That is the poodle attack in one slide or two slides. Does it make sense? Yeah? So hang on. Mahler's attack was 2002. The beast was 2011. There's no additional uh, trick needed beyond putting those two research papers or two descriptions side by side and then saying, oh, well, okay, that would work. Right? Why didn't it happen sooner? Why didn't I find it? What was I doing all this time? Right? <laughs> what a loser. Huh? I don't know. I guess there's not that much bit flipping involved, so maybe that's, <coughs> maybe that's the reason. Okay, so this is just saying what I just said. Here's the attack. Repeat until you've recovered all the cookie bytes. Use JavaScript in the browser. Hide your get requests. Move the cookie byte around that you're trying to recover. Do it enough. Do more attack each time uh, as an active man in the middle by you know, putting the target block on the end. And you will win eventually. Okay, and you can calculate the complexity. It's the size of the cookie times 256 on average. Worst case, it's much worse because it's kind of this probability you end up with a geometric distribution. It's not very nice, but the whole thing is, is doable. <coughs> okay. So, can we patch against the pool? Well, here's a patch that doesn't work. Okay, and I'll explain why. So, what you, of course, why, let's upgrade the encryption and the decryption. Let's use proper padding. 
let's protect against void these attack, let's, let's put in protection against lucky 13, you know, let's do proper, proper panning and check it properly. The problem is that the sender might not use the correct padding format, 020202 or whatever, because he's not required to under SSL version 3. So when you're checking the padding, when you receive a ciphertext and you, you decrypt it and look at the padding, you know, there's no reason that the sender would have sent you the correct padding. Of course you could say, let's upgrade all the clients and all the servers simultaneously. Okay, and make sure they're all doing the right padding at the same time. But that's completely infeasible and it's not going to happen. You can't mandate that everybody must upgrade their software. And the point is that the big uh, web companies, your Facebooks and your Amazons and your Googles, don't want to break any clients. They don't want to prevent any clients from working because they don't want to lose business. Right? They want to show you as many adverts as they can. So, um, in fact, the only major web browser that this now breaks is Internet Explorer 6. Is anybody in the room still using IE6? <laughs> right? The current version is 11, isn't it? I think, currently, IE11. Okay? So, you know, the, the amount of breakage here is very, very small. But still, there's breakage. The next problem is you can't, so that patch doesn't work. It's not deployable in practice. It's deployable in theory. Theory and practice are not the same. Okay? You can't use RC4 either because of what I'm going to show you next. So there's no cipher suites left that are secure for SSL version 3. You can't use CDC mode cipher suites because we just broke them. And you can't patch against them. And you can't use RC4 either. So there's a technical term for this situation. You're screwed. <laughs> That's the technical term. You'll have to take that out of the edge. All right. So you just witnessed the death of SSL version 3. Okay? That's what the death of protocol looks like. Sometimes it's very simple. Do you have a question? So this is a fact to me as all the sessions, right? And all yeah. the facts you've seen, they have this property. Yeah. Uh, Kill the session. So why don't we maybe, you know, an easy patch would be like, uh, if the server sees that there are a lot of connections that get killed, just yeah. you know, like put some sleep, so. Yeah, you could do that kind of thing on the on the server side. Right. On the client side, you could maybe uh, make sure that HTTP adds some extra random padding so you can't control where the cookie ends up. There, there are things you no, can do. Because I'm noticing that the session keeps getting killed and there's right. like, you know, there is some attack going on and let's sure. stop doing this. Thing. Sure, you could do that. Um, but that's a kind of... Yeah, if you, if you do that, you could do the attack slowly to avoid detection. Yeah, it's true. Because these session cookies will last for you know, days or weeks, right? Every time you... How many of you are on Facebook? Some of you are not admitting it, right? Or you're just not. Okay. When, you, when, you, when you first log into Facebook with your username and password, you get given a cookie back or a sequence of cookies, and those last for like days or weeks. They don't expire very quickly. At least that's my experience. So you could do this as a, as a stealthy attacker over a period of days or weeks. Yeah, so tricky one. Okay, good. So hang on. Nobody's using SSL v3, right? Shouldn't really be a problem. Well, uh, I got this today from SSL Pulse website, and this is based on the top 200,000 servers according to the Alexa rankings, which are important rankings. Here's the, t here's the version number and here's the percentage. Look, TLS 1.2 is above 40%, yay. SSL version 3 is like 95%. So 95% of servers still support SSL version 3. Okay, so if your client connects over SSL v3, you, you know, tries to, it probably will get SSL v3 if it wants to. But actually on the mailing list this afternoon, TLS mailing list, Rich Saltz, who's at Akamai. Akamai are a very large uh, content distribution network provider, so they like, they host content at various points throughout the internet. They say that they see less than 1% of SSL v3 traffic. So it's 99% TLS 1.0 and up. Okay? So the number of affected users is very small. But unfortunately, there's another problem. What's the final problem? Downgrade. You can be forced into using SSL v3 without even knowing it. Because a man in the middle attacker can deny you from connecting over 1.2, 1.1, 1.0 until you end up at SSL v3. And your client will automatically reconnect, trying different lower version numbers until he's at, he's at v3. So a determined attacker, you know, government level, could be actively doing this in the middle of your connections, force you back to v3, and then do the attack. So the only realistic solution, I think I've said this here, 
Yeah. The only realistic solution is to switch off SSL v3 in your clients and in your servers and hope that SSL v3 goes away as fast as possible. However, look here. SSL v2 is still supported by 20% of servers. <laughs> like years after it was kind of abandoned. I mean, this was like, SSL v3 came out in 1997 or something. That's like, how long ago is that now? 17 years? I can't even count that far back. And anyway, SSL v2, SSL v2 is still there. So it's going to take years to get rid of SSL v3 ever. Okay? But it's dead, it's broken. Okay, any questions about this attack, the Poodle attack? I hope you appreciate me staying up last night very, very late on Twitter trying to figure out what the hell is going on here. Actually, it's really simple. And any one of you could have found the attack having listened carefully to these lectures, including me. <laughs> okay. But none of us did. Right. Okay, so now let's come to the last topic that I'm going to talk about. When should I finish? Uh, yeah, I have an hour and a half or an hour. You have until uh, five. Okay. Lot, but then you'll get 5.15. 5.15. Yeah, I, okay. I'll go to 5.15, maybe 5.17, maybe 5.20. <laughs> okay. Now I'm going to show you about these RC4 attacks, okay? And this is like, if you're completely lost and you have no idea what I've been talking about for the last uh, three hours, now is a good time to switch back on again. Come back in, because this is a new topic. And it's really, really, it's even easier than the padding article attacks, right? It's kind of completely brain dead, but it works. Okay, RC4. Here's our classic picture again, Mac encode encrypt. And now we're going to use the RC4 string cipher. So what you notice is we don't have any padding anymore. The, what the string cipher does is it generates a key stream, like any good string cipher. And it has a key, generates a key stream, and you XOR the key stream onto uh, the payload and the Mac tag. So that's the encryption step, is just XOR. Okay, so what properties do we need of our, of our string cipher for it to be secure? Yes, that's a serious question. Anybody can answer. No? What, what's the what? basic property that stream cipher should have so that it's not vulnerable to attacks? Thank you, Nadia. So the output of the stream cipher should look like a random sequence of bits or bytes. Okay? Even though it's not random because it's generated by a deterministic process which depends on the key. But it should look pseudo random, or sorry, it should be pseudo random, i.e., it should look random. Okay, uh, here is the RC4 algorithm, which you can't read. <laughs> All I'll say about it is that it is the most beautiful, simple, elegant algorithm pretty much ever existed, ever invented. It's invented by Ron Invest in the early 90s. Um, basically, it's a byte oriented algorithm, it's very fast in software, it uses a table of 256 bytes, which is actually a permutation of all the possible byte values. This is the key scheduling phase. You start with the identity permutation, and then you mix up the permutation according to the values of the key bytes in some way. Okay, some fairly complex way. So at the end of this step, which you can't see, you've ended up with a permutation of all the byte values, which is kind of random. Okay, and then you start to generate the key stream bytes, which you also can't see, and well, it's very simple. You have two indices, i and j, into this array. i is just incrementing for each byte that you're going to produce. j is jumping around. You pick out the two bytes at positions i and j. You swap them over. You add them together in some funny way and use that to look up the table. And that gives you your output byte. So it's, it's really simple. It's really elegant. The details don't particularly matter right now. But it's, it's an algorithm with a very long um, heritage. And because it's very simple and very fast, it's pretty widely used. Okay, so it's not just used here. It was used in WEP and WPAT kit, and it's used in a Microsoft thing called MPPE. It's an option in Kerberos. It was an option in SSH. Uh, so, you know, it's around. It's very widely used. Okay, so as we saw, because of the beast, people were told to switch to RC4. And the people who switched then felt very smug when Lucky 13 came along. Right? They felt great. They'd made the right choice. Um, it's fast. And a survey, a monthly survey is done by the ICSI certificate notary, and their figures said about 50% in January 2013 of all TLS connections that they looked at were using RC4. And the other half at that point in time, what would they be using? 
CBC or no? Right? Yeah, no, no there. <coughs> roughly 50-50 split between RC4 and CBC. This is now 18 months ago, slightly, slightly longer, 21 months ago. Okay, but if there's a problem with RC4, which is it's known to have statistical weaknesses. It's known not to be a good pseudo-random <coughs> number generator, or a, you know, not give pseudo-random outputs. So, what do we know? Well, already in 2001, Mantan and Shamir said, look at the second output byte, Z2. Okay? So ZR here, or ZI, it's an R and I. It's an I, is the value of the ith key stream byte from the stream cipher. Okay? So Mantan and Shamir said, take the second output byte, the probability that equals zero, but well, what should it be? It's a byte. What should the, if it was a good stream cipher, what would the value be? 1 over 2 by 6. It's not. It's 1 over 1, 2, 8. It's twice as likely as it should be. Okay? Bad sign. Miranov said, you know, I can calculate the distribution of Z1, and it's not flat. It's actually a sign, a sign curve for some bizarre reason. Okay? And then things didn't really happen for a long time. In between here and what I'm about to show you, people were very, very busy breaking RC4 in WEP, for example. And that didn't rely on these statistical weaknesses, it, it relied on other properties of, of RC4, more or less. Then, um, the guys from uh, the Indian Statistical Institute in Calcutta got interested and started proving interesting results. So, this result concerns the second output byte, this result concerns the first out output byte, but what Mitra et al. showed was that the first 255 output bytes have a bias. The probability that ZR is equal to zero, where R runs over this range, is 1 over 256, which is what it should be, plus a little bit, plus something over 256 squared. And there's a constant there, and the constant's between 0.24 and 1.33. Okay? So think of this as being a bias of size about 1 over 256 squared, about 2 to the minus 16. It's pretty small, but it's there. And then in a slightly later paper, they showed something even more remarkable. Uh, they showed that there's a key length dependent bias. So here L is the length of the RC4 key in bytes. For RC4 in SSL, or TLS, sorry, L would be 16. And what they said is the probability that Z16 is equal to 240 in decimal now is at least as big as this value here, 1 over 256, plus this little glitch, 2 to the minus 16 again. Okay? So the key streams are not flat. Right? Then this is you might ask the question, well, why, why, is, why is RC4 still being so widely used if we know that it's not that good a stream cycle? What do you think? What would be the rational, kind of pragmatic, real-world reasons to use this thing, even though it doesn't have a flat distribution? Any ideas? It's theoretical. Yeah, it's only theoretical. There's no attack, right? It's fine. Until there's an attack, I don't have to do anything. Good? Anybody else? You're just Simple embedded, it's easy to use. It's, it's fast. In the yeah, it's, fast. it's everywhere. Everybody's <laughs> using it. I'm not worse than anybody else that use R support. What other reasons? I am using it. Uh, there's nothing else available because of the beast, right? I don't trust these client side patches, the record splitting patch for the beast. So I'm going to use RC4 now. I'm going to switch my server to only offer RC4 cybersuites. In fact, out of the top two hundred thousand Alexa websites, as of today, 2,000 of them are still offering only RC4 cyberspace. Okay? And you can get that from SSL Pulse website. So 1 in 100 are still only offering RC4. I find that really scary. Anyway, okay. And they don't use Kuntelmod because it's suspicious? That's what you said? Uh, it's not standardized, that's fine. There's no support oh, for it in the libraries. Yeah. And it didn't get standardized because it was suspicious. So the whole Sorry, I, I mixed up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole sequence of crazy reasons why, why we don't use it. Okay, so another reason is given as follows. Look, there are these biases, but look, they're only in the first few bytes. They don't encrypt anything interesting in TLS, so let's not worry. Okay, the biases are not exploitable in any meaningful scenario. This was said to me several times by, in, in those terms. RC4 is fast. Yes. <laughs> Speed is king. I'm worried about the beast, so we talked about that, and the experts told me to use RC4, so I'll use RC4. Google's using it. It must be okay for my side. This is the kind of safety of in the crowd mentality. Uh, what else do we have? Oh yeah, there's no demonstrated attack. Please show me my password, plain text, and then I'll leave you. Okay? Again, this whole thing about 
unless there's a demonstrated prototype proof of concept and there's a logo and a website, people are not going to take it too seriously. Okay, so what did we do? So this is joint work with Manuel Farban, Dan Bernstein, uh, Bertrand Pottery, and Jakob Schultz that was published at Usenet Security last year. We didn't have a cool name. We should have had a cool name. Uh, we did the following. We said, let's generate a whole bunch of RC4 keys. We generated two to the 45 of them, which is quite a big number. Uh, I can't even tell you what that is. It's like 32 trillion or something. And we computed statistics for each of the first 256 output bytes. Okay? Because we knew that these biases existed back here, okay? But we, and we thought we could exploit them, but what we didn't know whether there are any more biases. <coughs> Maybe this is not the comprehensive list yet. Maybe there's more to find. So let's, let me show you what we did find with these 245 key streams. This was like three or four months running on a few of Dan's machines in his lab. So his electricity bill went up a little bit, but you know, he doesn't pay directly, so no damage is done. Not green cryptography, but okay. So we find a bunch of new biases, that's the bottom line. And actually, I should mention that Izobi et al., a Japanese team, also discovered uh, some of these biases independently from us. So let me show you the key stream distribution at position one. So this is saying, generate these 245 keys, look at what the output byte value is, the, the, you know, the first byte of the key stream in RC4, over all those keys, and on the y-axis we have the probability, and along here we have the byte value from 0 to 255. Okay? What would this look like if this was an ideal stream cycle? <coughs> flat line. Yes? Should be a flat line starting at 0 0.003906 and going across and, you know, flat. It's clearly not flat. One thing I'll point out, see all these little glitches here? All these little glitches, those are real effects. Because the number of keys we took was so large that even these tiny differences are significant. Okay? <coughs> so you can see the kind of sign, but there's this big kind of deep spike. There's a hole in the sine wave. And that's a key length dependent bias. Because uh, the guys from India, uh, Calcutta, also did a computation, and they didn't get that spike. And the reason was because they didn't use 16 byte keys, they used random 256 byte keys. And that effect goes away at that point. Okay, that's position one. Here's position two. Oh my goodness. You recognize this? What did I tell you about position two? The Mantan bias, right? This is the Mantan, sorry, the Mantan Shamir bias. It's one over one, two, eight. It's like through the ceiling somewhere. It's like on the second floor. And then you've got this, everything else is depressed as a consequence. And all these little glitchy things are, are real. Okay, and there's this little spike down here, a little spike up there. But it's dominated by this behavior. Okay, and you can go on, and here's position three. Okay, there's a spike here, there's a couple of spikes there, and then there's this kind of general <coughs> trend, and you go forwards, and you start to see a pattern emerge. Okay, and what you get is, um, you get a bias towards zero. This is the bias that was observed by um, um, the Maitra et al. from Calcutta. Calcutta bias, if you like. Um, there's a bias towards value 9 in position 9, and towards value 8 in position 8, and so on. So there's two big biases, okay? And then a bunch of other stuff. And the size of these biases is about 2 to the minus 16. Okay, the, the, the size of the spike relative to the flat line is, is about 1 over 2 to the 16. In case. Okay, so it's great. And you see the spikes getting slightly smaller as you go along, okay? And you know you think you've got a pretty good picture of what's going on, right? And then we get to position 16. Whoops, there it is. Okay. Oh, it's some new behavior. <laughs> well, it's not actually new behavior because I also told you about this. So do you know what this, do you recognize this here? This is the key length dependent bias that was also observed by the Calcutta team. And this is at position 240. Okay? And it's big. It's way bigger than these biases. Again, it's, it's not on the second floor. It's maybe just through, this, through the ceiling up here somewhere. Okay? But it's pretty big. Okay, then things settle down again. And now you see the general trend, and everything's great. And there's, there's a funny thing going on here. You see this little spike here? Watch that little spike. Look, it moves every time. Okay, just to the left a little bit. That's not going to matter very much in attacks, but it's there. It's a real behavior. 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. 
And this again is real. Okay? So you've got this alternating behavior. And then uh, at position 128, you can't really, maybe you can't really see it, but there's a kind of a glitch, and it, it switches from odd even, odd even, odd even, to even odd even, odd even, odd even, odd even, odd even, odd even. <laughs> We don't know why, and nobody actually knows why that does that. And it's pretty small, okay? But that's a prelude to this. Okay? 32, and nobody had ever observed this bias because nobody had done the computation. Um, is this related to twice? The yes, size, yes, and you get similar spikes at positions 48, 64, 80, 96, 128, and then it stops. So the key, there's, these, there's a whole sequence of key length dependent biases. <coughs> they get smaller and smaller, but they're still significant. And at the same time, you have this bias here moving along, and this bias here it stays in position. Um, okay? Did you try doing any Fourier transform of the, of the bike no. together to amplify this stuff? Or whatever? No, no, no. There was, there was really no need. I mean, yeah. You can do all kinds of things, and maybe you'll find some extra patterns that we didn't observe. So not, most of this behavior excuse me, is now explained. We have a theoretical explanation for this spike, for this spike, and for these spikes as well, but not for this kind of um, zigzaggy behavior, for example. We don't know. Okay. So it's great. This is great fun. And you know, we did the dumbest thing you could possibly do, which was to switch on your computer, program RC4, spread it across a bunch of processors, and just you know, collect the results. Right? So for 15 years, people have been analyzing the hell out of RC4, improving things about it. Nobody ever did this, which strikes me as really interesting. Okay? So we, by being very, very... Sorry? Ah, I think if you discovered this, you'd have, you would have, uh, you'd have done something with it. Or, or this. Depends who you are. Okay? Good point. Good point. So maybe you have to be dumb to be clever sometimes. Okay. Good. So here's a picture of everything, right? This is this is a heat map, which on the x-axis now is the position between one and two five six. The y-axis is the byte value you're looking at. So this picture encodes 256 of those graphs that I showed before, and the color tells you how big the bias is or how strong the, the bias is. So what do we have here? It's quite difficult to see from where you're sitting, but if you look up here. There's a red dot, another red dot, another red dot, another red dot. Going down. These are at position 16, 32, and so on. This is the key length dependent bias. <coughs> Up here is another red line, which kind of fades. So red means big bias, fading into, into green, and then eventually kind of disappearing into blue. So you can see the relative size here. This is like uh, 0 0.5 is 0 0.5 times 2 to the minus 6. <coughs> times 2 to the minus 6. So that's the... the recording the bias size. And you see, this is the I bias. This is the, the bias that was moving along nicely. And this is the zero bias. In every position between 1 and 256, there's a bias towards zero. Okay? So this shows the complete thing. Okay. So are we done? What questions now spring to mind for you? What should we do next? Maybe you should go take more bytes? Or? Yeah, you could go further. That's a good idea. In fact, you won't find anything. You will in positions like 257, 258, 259, but then there appears to be nothing. So the single byte bias has disappeared beyond position 256. Okay. What else could you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll come to those. Good. There are maybe other kinds of biases that involve more than one byte at a time. And maybe those are also interesting to look at. But, you know, <laughs> I've been training you up to think like attackers, right, for the last however many days and hours. What are you going to do next? Huh? We break, we break TLS. <laughs> How do we break TLS, though? So, pretty picture, but where's the plain text, right? I gotta give you, I gotta show you the plain text, otherwise you're not gonna take me seriously. Okay? So, we're gonna build a plain text recovery attack against TLS by using these biases. We need the same plain text to be encrypted many times under different keys. Okay? This is sometimes called the broadcast setting. Right? How can we arrange that to happen? What's the only other, apart from bit flipping, what's the only other tool that I know how to use? Man in the browser. Right? JavaScript running in the browser just makes get requests. 
to the remote website, every one causes the cookie to be attached. Okay? But these biases are only in the first two, five, six positions. So I have to make sure that for every time I make my GET request, I'm doing it with a new TLS key to generate the new key stream. So I have to break the TLS connection by being an active man in the middle attacker, cause the connection to fail. The next GET request will get sent over a new TLS connection with a new key and a new set of well, the same biases again. Okay? So I can target the first two, five, six bytes here by repeatedly breaking the connection and making my GET request. And I should coordinate those two things. Okay? So we can realize this requirement. JavaScript in the browser, it's the beast again, okay? But without all the fancy same origin policy stuff and all the fancy uh, sliding, you don't need to do any of that. You might do nicely by sliding because you might be able to align the target blame text byte that you're after with one of these giant biases. And then maybe you can reduce the ciphertext requirements at the time. And we've looked at that too, and it helps a little bit. Okay, not so much. Okay, so now here's the attack then. Here's the, in a picture, and then on the next slide, I'll show you the mathematics. Okay? It's not very complicated, though. So here's our encryption, C1 down to Cn, all the fixed plain text under lots of different keys. So each of these is a stream of bytes encrypting a fixed plain text in some position. So let's pick a position R. This is going to be our target plain text byte. So we're making the assumption that the same plain text byte has been encrypted here, 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 and here, all the way down. Okay? That's this beast thing again. So now what do I do? Well, I'm just going to guess the value of P, the plain text candidate. So if I make a guess for P, I'm going to make there's 256 possibilities for P. Okay, it's a byte. I'm going to XOR it with the ciphertext in each of these ciphertexts. What will I get? A distribution? Yeah? If I guess correctly, what distribution do I get? The key stream. The key stream which is basically blah, 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 what was in this picture. Okay, So we're taking a slice in some sense. We're fixing a position R, let's say 128. We're taking a slice up here. If I guess correctly, I should get that distribution. Okay, If I have enough ciphertext, if N, the number of ciphertext, is large enough, okay, by guessing P correctly um, and XORing with all of these ciphertext bytes, I will get something in a red box, which says, I think, <laughs> well, I can't even read it this close. It really has gone. It's on my screen. It says yields induced distribution on byte ZR. Okay? So this is giving you a distribution on the R byte of P stream. So it'll either be if P is the correct guess, this will look like the correct distribution. And if P is a wrong guess, it won't look like the correct distribution. And what you do is you so then you combine it with a known distribution, which we've We've sampled with these 245 key streams, and you calculate formally the likelihood. Okay, exactly the kind of thing that uh, Francois Xavier was talking about this morning. You calculate the formal likelihood that this is the correct value of p, given your data and given what you know about the key stream distribution. It's a question. Why wouldn't the distribution work if it was a normal distribution? Ah, because in that case, this would have been flat. And every value of P would have had the same likelihood. You wouldn't be able to separate them. Okay? And we'll see that in just a moment, actually. I'll when we get to perform mathematics, you can see what happens when all of these probabilities are the same. Nothing works. Anymore. Anton? Just one thing. If you, if you don't care that much about the, the quantity of data, yeah. it, you can do it in a slightly simpler, simpler way. You just take the most frequent value. Sure. And you XOR it with the most frequent value of mm -hmm. the key stream and you get the, you get the offset. Unfortunately, that doesn't work. Morally, it should work. But in reality, it doesn't because the bias towards zero is not always the biggest bias. No, but I mean, you, you look at the big, biggest bias in Z. Z oh, yes, 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 yes. Then yes. You know Sorry. Yeah, but that's highly suboptimal, as it turns yes, out. I know, and this is, what, this is actually what Izobi et al. Simple. This is what Izobi et al. did. And it doesn't give you the best results, let's say. There's a significant difference between, between So this is, this is, maybe it's an important point. A lot of people thinking about broadcast attacks previously, including Mantan and Shamir, said, oh, we've broken RC4 because we could, now with this one bias, we can do the attack. But they didn't take into account the fact that there might be other biases which might be competing against that bias when it comes to estimating likelihoods. Okay? Yeah. So you have to be a little bit careful. Uh, a lot of people made uh, statistical claims that were completely 
palette when you were when you were doing these things. So you really have to work with the whole distribution. And then it's more efficient. But it's yeah. difficult. You need to do this exhaustive search. Yeah. Well. Yeah. 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 It's, it's easy to implement. We'll, Once we'll, again, it's a convolution product. You might. Be, you can maybe do it with some so yeah, analog yeah. and algorithm or something. Okay, so the recovery algorithm then is, in the end, you pick the plain text byte that gives you the highest probability, or the highest likelihood, which is a formal statistical measure, okay? And you can do this for any position R, <coughs> the first two, five, six positions where you have a big bias, or any biases, okay? So here's the mathematics. It's Bayes' theorem. So let's suppose, I think we have time for this, let's suppose that we have, a, we look at all the ciphertext bytes in position R, Okay, so that's that slice going down from before. And let's call it C. Okay, it's a bit misleading. It's not one ciphertext. It's a single byte from many ciphertexts, making a vector. And let, let's have uh, the Q00 up to QFF being the byte probabilities in the key stream in position R. So that's that slice. That's this picture here, basically. These values for, for all of these positions, between, sorry, all these values between 00, zero and FF. Okay? Now you apply Bayes' theorem, and you do a little bit of messing around, and you make a couple of assumptions. You assume that the plaintext probability is a constant and is independent of everything. <coughs> Actually, you can do much better by making a different assumption here, but that's for the future. Uh, you, can, you make this assumption, which is kind of standard in this analysis, that the, the distribution of the side text is independent of the plaintext. And you see, if I want to maximize the probability that the plain text byte has a particular value p, given the ciphertext bytes, then it's the same as maximizing the probability that, the, that z is equal to, the key stream is equal to c x or p, given p equals p. Okay? And you can actually now calculate this, so sorry, to maximize this over all choices of p, you have to maximize this here, this probability of the key stream, and it's just given by this expression. You take the number of occurrences of byte value 0, 0, and you take Q00 to that power. And then Q01 to N01, and so on. And this is just doing basic probability, right? It's a product of individual byte probabilities. And now we come back to your question. If all of these Qs were equal to each other, then no matter what choice you made of your byte value, this, the, all of these numbers Nx would be appearing here, and you would just get Q to the sum of the Nx's. And that would be a constant, because the sum of the nx is, is equal to the total number of ciphertexts you have. So this would, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's clear, but you can see from this equation, if you stare at it hard enough, that the uniform distribution cannot be attacked. Okay? So maybe that's a little bit much to take in in, 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 in two minutes, but uh, trust me, uh, I'm not just a bit flipper, I also know how to apply base here. And this works. Okay, so the question, what's the next question? What's the next thing you have to do, Claudio? I'm yeah. So you have to do some experiments, right? You have to see, well, how, how effective is this procedure? Does this procedure actually work? And how, what would you like to minimize in the attack? The number of ciphertexts. Because each ciphertext corresponds to breaking the TLS session of the connection and starting a new one. And it corresponds to the man in the browser, or the JavaScript in the browser, and sending another get request. So you'd like to <laughs> minimize N, the total number of ciphertexts you need. Okay, so let's look and see. If you have two to the twenty ciphertexts, or two to the twenty sessions, here is your success probability as a function of the byte position that you're looking at. So we're thinking about recovering one byte and we're measuring the success probability. You do pretty badly out here. Look at these spikes though. Do you recognize the position? Okay, 16, 32, 48. Okay? This is because the key length dependent bias is so large that it dominates everything else. And in that case, Antoine's idea of just using the biggest bias would work very nicely. Okay? And you would, you know, you get this kind of performance. So, and up here, this is position, uh, position two, which corresponds to the Mantan Shimir bias. Okay? This is this gigantic bias. So you get 100% success probability for recovering the second playtest byte with two to the 20 encryptions. That's pretty effective. Right. You can generate uh, 6 million encryptions per hour. All right. So 2 to the 20 would take like 15 minutes. Okay. What next? What should we do next? What would you like to do? Slide. Slide. 
No, we're not going to slide today. Sorry. You could slide. So if you had a target byte that you wanted to get, you could slide it around so that it kind of hits this peak thing. Okay? And then you would do better in recovering that plate in spite. So yeah, you could slide. But the next natural thing to do is to increase the amount of cybertext we have and see what happens. Okay? So let's go to 2 to the 21. Let's go up in parallel 2. Here's 2 to the 21. So we've done a little bit better. 2 to the 22. 2 to the 23. 2 to the 24. And now you see this general trend that in the spikes, these are these giant QM dependent biases. We're, you know, we're doing really, really well. So now sliding would make great sense, okay, if we can do it. And we're not doing so well everywhere else, but look, you know, we're doing better at the start than we are at the end. And this is because the biases get smaller as you go out towards position 256, okay? It's harder and harder to recover plain text. But you can keep going, 25, 226, 227, 228. How far would you like to go? Well, you'd like to get 100% success rate in the first 256 position. To do that, you have to go all the way to 2 to the 32, and you almost get there, but you don't quite. There are 97% or something, okay, in all the first 256 byte positions. Okay, that's a lot. I mean, to do these experiments, okay, that's 2 to the 32 sessions to do one experiment, but we did 256 experiments for each data point. So that's 2 to the 40 key streams just to compute that single data point there. All right, so doing experiments here is, is quite expensive. That's what. Do you collect these data complexity your bias? No, we don't do that. If, if you had a single large bias, then you can do it using standard statistical techniques. It's really easy in that case. You're trying to distinguish um, uh, one peak from, actually from many peaks as you, as you permute the, choosing different plain text bytes basically permutes the distribution. And you want to find the, the one that matches most closely to a single bias. And it's easy in that case. You can, but if you have a more complex distribution, let's go back to the picture. I think there's a picture of it somewhere. Oh, here, for example, this was position, I don't know, uh, 13 or 16, I guess. You've got three biases. And getting a good statistical handle on exactly what's going on there is more difficult. I mean, you can do it using. Um, uh, what's it called? Uh, cool back Weebler divergence, I think. KL divergence. You could you could do it, but we wanted to see the plain text, so we you know we did it we did it just by simulation. Okay, good. So I want to show you this again because I think it's great. Uh, we'll start with Tuesday twenty and we'll work our way up. Okay, so here we go. Watch the spikes. Watch the general increase. All right, good. And we're done. Okay, I actually thought this attack doesn't work. I've been lying to you. I'm sorry. Why does it not work? Well, okay, first of all, you need a lot of connections to get reliable recovery. Second of all, you've got to force TLS session negotiation or session presumption. We don't know how to do that from within JavaScript. So you need an active man in the middle attacker to break the connection, not the man in the browser. Okay? That's okay. I mean, everybody else is using that too. But wouldn't it have been cool if it was a completely uh, on the wire passive attack? if you just had to have the JavaScript running to create the chosen plain text. That would have been nice. We couldn't do that. The next thing is that you can only target the first 220 bytes of application data. Why? Well, when the TLS handshake runs, the first message that gets encrypted is the finished message from the client to the server. And that's the output of a PRF, and it changes for every handshake run. So you can't predict, you don't have constant plain text there. So you lose those 36 bytes corresponding to the finished message. And then, in fact, there's nothing interesting in the first 256 bytes anyway. In particular, there are no cookies there, which is what we would really like to get. That's the constant plain text that we would like to recover. Okay, we can't get it. That's kind of disappointing. But actually, this was enough to get a Usenix paper. So our, <laughs> our, submission, our submission to Usenix security only contained this attack, and it was accepted. There you go. Somebody must be fighting for us. I don't know. Okay. Anyway, we went further, so we came up with another attack, and now we start to use other forms of bias. What we really want is biases that go longer than the first 256 bytes, because there's nothing interesting in the first 256 bytes, right? So we use these things called the fleur McGrew biases, and these are really interesting. So these are ancient as well. These are from like 2002 or 2004. And what they say is that, look at pairs of bytes. You can barely see this, but for example, uh, 
Okay, here, byte pair 0, 1 in consecutive positions uh, arises with probability 2 to the minus 16 times 1 plus 2 to the minus 8. If this was a good string cipher, the probability would be 2 to the minus 16. But there's this little increase in the probability. A little glitch. Now it's of size 2 to the minus 24. Before it was of size 2 to the minus 16, the, the biases were working. So the biases are now a lot smaller. But there's more of them. And this, this condition on I means where are you in the stream mod 256. So this says you can, this, this bias will arise for any position I in the stream as long as, as it's not 0 or 1 mod 256. Okay. So 254 out of 256 positions, you'll get the 0, 1 bias in consecutive. And likewise for all the other ones. Okay, so we use these now to build another attack, which will target any plain text byte in any position, uh, as long as it's repeated often enough. And now we don't need session renegotiation or session reduction. So now it all happens in a single session. Okay, so we solve both of the problems that we had before. So how does it work? Well, it's a little bit hard to explain, um, but imagine. We've got our plain text copies, one, two, three, and now we're going to do some padding and some sliding, like we suggested before, and we're going to make sure that, say, the target byte that we're after here is always aligned with the same positions in the key stream, mod 256. Okay? So this, let's say, for the sake of argument, this is position 0 and 1, mod 256, 0 and 1, mod 256, 0 and 1, mod 256, and we align, we, we, we put some padding in here to make sure that everything is lined up nicely. So now we have the same plain text bytes aligned with the same positions mod 256 in the key stream. That means <coughs> that the Fleur McGrew biases will be the same in each of these two positions. Okay? And maybe now you can kind of see what you would do. Uh, you, you guess two plain text bytes. This is not the optimal thing to do, but you guess two. You work out what the induced. Oh, okay. You start with a ciphertext, sorry. You guess two bytes of plain text, that gives you an induced distribution on the key streams again. And now you compare with the Fleur McGrew distribution, the Fleur McGrew biases. Now, you have to be careful. What if there were more biases than these? Well, then it wouldn't work properly, okay? In fact, we did a huge computation, two to the 46 key streams, I think, and we didn't find any more biases. So, Fleur McGrew list is comprehensive. So, that's what we need. Okay, so you do this, uh, you now do the kind of likelihood estimation thing again, but actually what you do is you go byte by byte. So you, you start with a pattern of length two, and then you add a byte at a time, and you kind of use these overlapping things, and you build an approximate likelihood uh, distribution, an approximate likelihood value for a particular sequence. And it's kind of, a, do any of you know about dynamic programming? Have you heard of that? Or the Viterbi algorithm? No? Okay. Look it up on Wikipedia if you don't know it, it's really cool. And it's kind of what we're using in here to do this for us. Okay, so it becomes a vision. Huh? I was just, They must have seen it. I just think they're getting <laughs> to the end of their. No? Okay. You haven't seen it? Okay. Hmm? It's sort of standard in algorithms classes in computer science. Antoine? Can you answer the question? If you can uh, match one known bit, yeah. match one unknown yeah. one. Whenever you observe the non bit on the output, you know that it was a zero, yeah. so you just sample this one and, uh, and try to use uh, the second one. Precisely. Well, the, optimal, the, the most frequently occurring value of the second one when the first one is zero. Precisely. To, to, to say, that, okay, to guess that this, yeah. this so one. Yeah, the, so that's exactly what you do. So you use the conditional distribution of by r plus one on by r which yeah. you can calculate from the joint distribution of the two bytes by dividing out by the probability of the second one. And what we also do is we assume maybe that the first byte is known. If we're targeting cookies, the first byte would be, you could make it to be the last byte of the string okay. Equal equals, yeah, cookie. exactly. So you can get a little kind of, a uh, little help to get started. And then you go byte by byte, and you can also use a termination trick, because at the end of the cookie there's another known plain text, so you then use a different procedure for the last byte. And you put all of that together to, to, to make the attack as, as good as you can. And that's what we did. Uh, and so there's something blue there. Uh, here's the thing that really matters. What's the performance of the attack? So percentage, success rate up and down here. Let's look at the blue. This is the 
success rate for recovering a 16 byte cookie, 16 bytes long. And I think we assume it's base 64 encoded as well. So we got an extra bit of help from there. We don't have to try all of the candidates. <coughs> And the number of playtexts that you need is something like, you know, 8 times 2 to the 30, which is 2 to the 33. So the plaintext requirement, or ciphertext requirement, sorry, oh, yeah, not plaintext copies, ciphertext copies. The, the requirement of the attack has gone up, yeah, if it was plaintext copies, it would be easy, right? You just output the plaintext. Okay, ciphertext. Uh, so it's higher than it was for the single byte attack. But those biases were much smaller. They were 2 to the minus 8. Two to the eight times smaller than they were before. Okay, going from single byte biases to fluor and group. So we're doing pretty well actually. Okay. Good. So can I have <coughs> two moments? Sure. It's, yeah. Okay. So there are countermeasures, and you know, uh, as usual, the people in the industry thrashed around trying to rescue RC4, okay, with various things. None of them really work very well, and the actual countermeasure is to stop using RC4. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And actually, there are other reasons to stop using it. There are persistent rumors that NSA can break RC4 in real time. I don't know if those are true. I don't know what real time means, but there are rumors. <coughs> and maybe it's time you should start taking those rumors seriously. Just please stop using RC4. Okay. People responded. Uh, the most interesting response was the. I think this is the bravest response of all. I'm not sponsored by Microsoft. <coughs> they disabled RC4 by default in Windows 8.1 and the latest Windows Server code. So they said, "Hey, we're not going to use RC4 anymore, at least in TLS, which is great." They still use it in something called MPPE, and we broke that as well. So that's that's <laughs> going to be presented at Asia Print this year. Ah, it's some crappy uh, VPN protocol that uses RC4. And actually what it does, just, just to amuse you, is it takes a random key and then it fixes some of the bytes to, to known values. Because that helps. It actually makes the biases bigger, which helps our attacks. So thank you, Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, yes. What I want to say. So, okay. Uh, let me close out by just saying what's happening now in terms of TLS. So, it's changing all the time, right? There was this new attack yesterday. It's an exciting place to be. Um, I think CBC mode is gradually going away because it's, getting, it's very hard <coughs> to make it secure, but it will take years to die. Uh, if you look at the current status of RC4 in the internet, it's the same project. Remember, it was 50% 18 months ago. Now, if you look at the top cyber suites, it's down to 35%. That's not the effect that I was hoping to have, right? It's not gone low enough. So right now, actually, I've got two separate projects going on to try to improve the attacks in various ways, to, to, to you know, show people that attacks do get better, you shouldn't ignore them, to try to decrease that number. Of so usage. This is usage. This is based on putting probes in the internet and measuring TLS connections. So this is based on their you know, 16 billion connections. <coughs> okay, so more work is needed to kill it off. Uh, we're getting there with TLS 1.2. Okay, you might wonder why is it that we're not using that much uh, GCM yet? It's because of the negotiation process. This graph is interesting. This is null encryption. 2.6% of TLS connections are not using any encryption at all. <laughs> but at least there is no, no specific attack. No. <laughs> <laughs> Should we write a paper about an attack? <laughs> I think I can do it with one ciphertext. <laughs> that would be pretty. That would be. Yeah, get it. It do you think it would get into Unix? It doesn't count. It's a trivial attack. I know. So I count. know. Well, the, the RC4 attack is also trivial, actually. <laughs> the, the one that was accepted to Unix security is you switch on your computer, you compute the biases, you do a standard likelihood analysis, and kaboom. Yeah? You don't have to do much. So why, why is that RSA is shy? So, why do you, so there's key negotiation here, right? RSA. Right. So they're setting up a master key. And then they're using integrity protection via HMAC SHA-1, but they're not using any encryption. They have the null encryption algorithm. I have no idea. Maybe, maybe Nadia knows. Yeah, yeah. Why, is it, uh, what, why, why do we have null encryption in, in nearly 3%, well, 2.5% of all the TLS images? It doesn't seem good, does it? I think there's something in your right to be done here. 
find out what's going on. Maybe all of these are being uh, man in the middle by NSA, right? That's fine. <laughs> Maybe this is all the cryptographer's connections. <laughs> I don't know. Interesting. Okay, uh, GCM, I guess we'll go through this. It's, it, GCM's okay. We could have done better. There would have been faster algorithms in GCM. We could have used OCB, designed by Phil Rogaway and, and uh, Ted Krobatz. Uh, it would be super fast, but there are patent issues or IP issues around OCB, actually. Uh, Phil has licensed uh, OCB to everybody who wants to use it, except for military purposes, uh, which kind of makes it hard to, you know, to standardize the anyway. So GCM is there. And then um, new algorithms are being considered by the working group. Uh, there's a lot of interest in this cha 20 stream cipher. This is a Dan Bernstein design in combination with Poly 13 and 5 Mac. It's been analyzed by uh, Gordon Proctor, uh, Royal Holloway, and he shows that it's a good AEAD scheme, assuming that you have an ideal stream cipher component, assuming that ChaCha20 is a good stream cipher. Uh, but you know, if you want to make a name for yourself, break ChaCha20, or improve the best known truth analysis of ChaCha20. You would be making a name for yourself and doing a service for the ITF, and I would love to hear from you if you, if you manage to do it. Okay. Oh, there's this Goodman draft, RFC 7366, or actually RFC now, for uh, encrypt and Mac in CBC mode, okay? Uh, but it doesn't mention Lucky 13. Bummer. And then where TLS is really focused now is building 1.3. And this is um, interesting, let's say. Uh, and I encourage you to get involved and to see what's happening on the mailing list. And if you can contribute to this process, join in and contribute because it needs cryptographers to look at it to make sure that it's secure. Okay, so coming down to the very end, what have I taught you? Well, various things I hope that I know about cryptography. Um, that bad cryptographic choices are hard to undo. You remember when Toyota had the problem with its cars and the braking system wasn't working properly and they could recall all of their cars and fix them and send them back out again? We don't seem to be able to do that for crypto software. There's no recall program for TLS, right? There's no easy way of forcing everyone to stop using uh, SSL version 3, for example, or to stop using version 4. I wish there was. Um, there's a lot of pressure from attacks against TLS, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed learning about them. I would also say that you know, designing AES is really hard. Making a secure block cipher is really hard. But actually, good protocol design is also hard. Putting the components together in the right way to build TLS or TLS 1.3 is not easy. A lot of the attacks are really obvious, like we talked about the Poodle attack, right? If you know what you're doing, it's not rocket science. It's not even brain surgery. Okay? It's really easy. Um, but I would say that a lot of crypto theory is also obvious in retrospect, too. So I think you have to have the right mentality to, to go look, looking for these attacks, to dig around the source code, to read specifications and figure out what's going on. And please keep in mind that to convince people that, you have a, that, that they have a problem, you've got to show them their cookies or their password or, or you know, some kind of plain text. And then they might take you seriously. Okay? Uh, there's lots of things you could do if you're interested. Lots of research directions. Um, I'll probably be trying to do, once I've done this current stuff on RC4, I'll be trying to do something else. Because I don't want to be here in five years' time giving another summer school on attacks on TLS, right? Somebody else should do that. So, uh, if you enjoy these lectures, then uh, please come to <laughs> Real World Crypto in 2015, January 7th or 9th. There's lots of good speakers, and there's other speakers here that are not even named, even more exciting, so you can find out who they are on the website. Okay, and I'll leave you with some literature. Thank you very much for your attention.